Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and in each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join me as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your journey to healing. Today, I am so excited to have Heather Ardema, Ardema. Uh, she's a former TV and ad executive, spent two decades convincing people that they needed to have the latest gadget to be happy. That's marketing at its best, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to find meaning towards the end of her corporate career, she couldn't take off her extra weight. Her home was cluttered and life felt heavy. She then discovered minimalism, the intentional pursuit of focusing on what matters most, and she felt herself getting lighter by the day. Heather left corporate, and today she has helped thousands tackle their clutter, uncomplicate their lives, and lose their excess mental, emotional, and physical weight for good. I am so excited to dive in, Heather. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. Me too, because this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I have so often in so many stages of my life realized that I do not function well when there is clutter around. And I love one of my favorite activities if I have free time is to go through my closet and to get rid of clothes and to like, and I have like these secret rules of like, say I buy a pair of shoes, I have to get rid of one and give it away or whatever. Now, thank goodness my sister's, she's a little smaller than me, but she's about my size. So she gets a ton of clothing from me. <laughs> That's and so nice. She loves it. Like, cause I'm always like, this is, this is new with tags actually. Yeah. And I will, but today I want to dive in because this topic is so relevant on so many levels as you listed it. It's not just the physical environment, it's a mental clutter. Before we dive in on that, tell us a little bit about your story, because it sounds like you had quite a journey to this um, process. Well, I actually had a lot of clutter in my life, and I had all types of clutter. So I not only had a lot of things, because I like to buy things, and I like that dopamine hit, it felt good, but I had other types of clutter as well. I uh, I would fill up my calendar to the pa- like, to the point of just way too full. My mom used to say to me, Heather, you're going to burn the candle at both ends. Slow down, slow down. I, uh, I also had some, what I like to call my corporate clutter. I worked in corporate for two decades. I had some incredible experiences. And, uh, and then at the end of the two decades, I was starting to feel empty. And I, um, I had moments where I was really questioning why I was still there. And it was the golden handcuffs. It was, well, you've got a nice salary. You can afford all these things you're buying. Uh, but I was not happy. And so having a lot of clutter in my life in various forms was really distracting me from the things that mattered most. And so I'm grateful today that I have decided to let go of those distractions and really lean into the life that, that I want to live. I love that. And thank you for sharing because I think so many people don't even realize. And I love that you made it much broader than just um, the clutter in our houses, which can be a big deal. I also love, and I want to dive into each of these topics, shopping, right? I mean, uh, or even busy schedule. So I learned a long time ago, I don't do drugs or alcohol or those kinds of things, but we can actually have an addiction to shopping. Like you said, those dopamine hits or getting new things or addiction to being busy. And for both of those things, I have experienced those kind of like difficult to break connections. Why don't you first just define, you've you kind of mentioned clutter on multiple levels. What is clutter and why does it affect our ability to concentrate and do and focus on what we love most? Oh, what a great question. So I like to look at clutter as anything that gets between where we are and where we want to be. And it's not just the stuff, but it's also the thoughts, the feelings, and the actions that get between where we are and where we want to be. And so clutter represents distraction. It represents um, living on autopilot, living by default instead of by design. And uh, a lot of us do have clutter. And I... uh, no judgment. We're human. And our world today is set up to distract us. Society wants us to be distracted. Go, go, go. Do, do, do. Don't slow down. And uh, and so clutter, yes, it's anything 
or thought, feeling, or action that can get between where we are and where we want to be. And as humans, we all have it. And the good news is, is that clutter is optional. It's optional. And so when we realize the clutter in our lives, we have this incredible opportunity to let it go. So there lies the rub, right? I know in your work, you help people deal with this, but I think the bigger issue is, I bet there's a lot of listeners, and I know I've been there myself sometimes where there's a room that's a mess or there's a storage unit that you need to get rid of, which speaking of, that's one of the biggest upcoming (laughs) businesses right in the US because people have so many things, way too much stuff and they have to buy a unit to store their stuff. I always thought that was ridiculous. Do you know, do you know that there are more storage units in the States than there are McDonald's and Starbucks combined? No. And do you know, because not all of us have storage units, do you know that we lose a year of our lives looking for things because they're lost somewhere in our homes or in our storage units. Wow. See that, that brings it home. So where I was going is I think people realize this is an issue and a lot of people actually probably want help. And they're like, I would love Heather to get decluttered. I love to this mental or my calendar. For me, that was usually it. I would overbook, like you mentioned in your corporate world and I could, it looked great on the calendar. And then I got to that specific day and I was like, I need, I almost feel suffocated. I'm like, I need more space. And for me, I'm a very like, um, I I should have been like a nun or a monk because I like that quiet contemplative time and um, and time in nature. So when my schedule is too busy, I don't function well. And I know that. So I, I could sometimes look at my day and be like, like, I can't do this. Right. And thank goodness I've really moved from that. And I have a lot more space, but back to our original question, because this is where the listener is comes in. They're like, what do I do? How do I start? And what are the mental blocks around getting rid of clutter? Because you might know that you need to or want to, but you still might not be able to put it into place. So how do you talk to these people who have the desire, but they're not sure how to start? Oh, okay. So, so often people will try to declutter and they'll putz from here to there and they'll realize, you know what? I'm not making any progress. And they will spend years doing this, sometimes decades. The reason why we don't make progress in the beginning is because we don't get to the root cause of our clutter. That's step number one. Why do you have the clutter? What holes are you trying to fill? What are the stories behind those things, behind why you're having trouble letting go? And an exercise that I love doing with my clients, and it might sound a little wonky or a little silly, but it's so powerful, it's so transformative is to sit down and take out a pencil or a pen and write yourself a letter from clutter. And it goes like this. Dear Dr. Jill, I am clutter and this is what I want you to know. And you just let your heart come out onto that paper. And then once you're done, you sign it, love clutter. And usually 99% of the time, The root cause of your clutter will come through in that letter. And often I have people writing two, three, four pages and they come to me in tears saying this was the most incredible exercise I've ever done. And so why do others not have success? It's because they're not slowing down and saying, wait a second, why do I have this clutter? What's that root cause? Clutter is a symptom. And typically, it's a symptom stemming from childhood, some kind of childhood perceived trauma. And when we give ourselves the gift to get curious, so many doors open. And so to start, I would say, get to the root cause of your clutter. Now, yeah, yeah, right? It's It's a powerful experience. Now, once you've done that and you're getting excited, you're gonna declutter, I want you to remind yourself that decluttering is uncomfortable in the beginning. (laughs) Excuse me. So you mentioned, Dr. Jill, in the beginning, you mentioned for you, you love to lighten up your space. It's kind of fun. And I promise all my clients that they will get to the place where you are, where decluttering can feel light and energizing. And you actually... You take that dopamine that you used to get from buying things that actually transfers over to to lightening up your home and your space. However, for most of us, 
we're thinking about decluttering as a job yeah, and it feels heavy yeah. and it feels hard and it's full of judgment and shame. And so what I like to remind my clients is it's uncomfortable. And I saw this exercise once. I thought it was so powerful. And so are you open to doing the exercise sure. with me? Take your hands, clasp them together with one thumb over the other. Okay. Now do it again with the opposite thumb on top. How's that feel? A little weird. Yeah. Weird, uncomfortable, uh -huh. awkward. That is how change begins or change feels in the beginning. And decluttering is change. And so what I like to say is that's a good sign when it feels uncomfortable in the beginning, because you can make it mean that you are making progress, that you're moving forward, that you're actually doing something. And as long as we lean into that discomfort, I promise one baby step after another, you will lighten your home. And when you lighten up your home, you tend to lighten up your body as well. A lot of my clients lose weight, any excess weight, and you lighten up your life. So those little baby steps, reminding yourself that clutter is or decluttering is uncomfortable in the beginning and that that's okay. Those are some ways to get started. Love this conversation so much. Um, I want to get to kind of some of the research, the physiology and psychology behind clutter. We touched on that, but one thing that touched me as you were talking about the letter, you know, to hear Dr. Jill, here's your clutter. And I think for me, this is very relevant to the busy schedule. So I'll speak on that because I don't like to have a lot of things in my space, but um, for whatever you are, listener out there, if it's things at your desk and you have tons of stuff going on, um, all those things affect it. I want to talk to you, Heather, about why psych psychologically this affects us, but I want to go to dear the letter, because I think that letter was profound. I want you, if you're listening to think about that and maybe do the practice to get started. But what I learned in my busy schedule was, um, now I've done a lot of work around somatic healing and trauma and all of that. So I feel like I'm in a much better spot. But before I did this work, when I would declutter um, my schedule and have space, space created anxiety because I had to feel emotions that I didn't want to feel. And yeah. that I never practiced sadness, anger, grief, and I had 40 years, because about 40 years old when I started doing the work of accumulated sadness and grief and different things. I went through cancer at 25 and I never really grieved some of those things. So keeping busy allowed me to not feel and allowed me to keep that pattern. And when I wanted to heal and go to the next level, I had to create space in order to feel again. But just like the hands, yeah. when that first started bubbling up, I thought I was going to die. Literally like the tsunami of grief that came when I first opened up my schedule to sit still, which I never knew how to do. Right. And that was from space. It was so overwhelming that I literally thought this is horrible, but guess what? When you just like the uncomfortableness of decluttering, um, when you start to process and go through that, it gets more and more comfortable. And the very first time is very uncomfortable. It, to me, it felt like a tsunami wave of grief coming and it was like going to drown me. But as I sat with it and I knew I was going to be okay and I let it come over me, then the next time it came, it was easier and the next and the next and the next. And I still don't like to be sad, but when that happens now, I'm really confident because I'm like, no, 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 I can sit with this. I can. And that's a, an interesting example because it's not like maybe everyone else's clutter, but speak to the psychology and the physiology behind clutter. I will. I will. In one moment, isn't it a gift that we get to experience every emotion in life? Yes. So often we're taught that we should just be happy all the time. And I think that thought is clutter personally, because love it, <laughs> right? Yeah. I am here for a full, full human experience. Mm -hmm. So if I were an alien and I got the opportunity to come to earth, I know this sounds so silly. And they said, you can either just be happy all the time or you can experience all the feelings. I would choose all the feelings. It, it helps create a complete life, I think. And something I like to do with my clients is we will draw a circle and we'll put a line through the circle. And I'll say, what are all the feelings you want to experience? Put those on the right side, the positive feelings. So engaged, excited, lifted. Those are types of things that they would, enthusiastic, they'd put on the right side of the circle. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on the left side of the circle, I say, okay, now, what are some of the negative feelings, perceived negative feelings that you're willing to experience on this journey? 
And it's like, what? What? No, the, the, if you're going to have a full experience and decluttering can be an incredibly spiritual experience. It can be a sacred experience. And what are some of those feelings that have a heavier vibration that you're willing to experience like discomfort, uncertainty, doubt, fear, pain, grief. Okay. Write those down as well. Write those on the left-hand side. Now, as a society, we move from left to right. So to get to those higher vibrational feelings, it's natural to go through the heavier ones first. Yeah. And we can use that as a little bit of a roadmap mm -hmm. to remind ourselves that it's okay. I love that. I bet you experience with people declutter, they have some emotional releases, right? Oh my goodness. Yes. And at all stages and decades of life, mm -hmm. I, I, it's, it's just tremendous. It's such a gift and an honor to work with people that are, are curious about letting go that want to create lightness that are looking all around at, at all the heavy things saying, why did I, why did I accumulate so much? Now I do like to say no judgment. Yeah. We're not going to judge why we accumulated. That's human. It's neutral. Our clutter is neutral. It does not mean anything bad or good about us. But if we want to create that lighter life, we can. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the research, the research is fascinating. And there's more and more as each month progresses. So I'll share just two brief studies that I find really interesting. The first study was done where they took the group of respondents and they had them work in either a messy office or a clean office for 10 minutes. Upon leaving, they were offered an apple or a candle, candy bar. If you worked in the clean office, you were twice as likely to choose the apple over the candy bar. Our surroundings absolutely impact our decision-making. And for me, it totally hits home. If I come into my house and there's random socks everywhere, I have two boys, two teenage boys, and if there are random socks everywhere, I can feel the clutter. I can just feel it. And I will go into the kitchen and look for some plantain chips or just look for food if I'm not even hungry. And uh, if I walk into my house and it's calm and clean and serene, I'll probably go find the leash and take my dog for a walk. Yeah. yeah. You can feel clutter, right? You, when you oh, feel I clutter. Totally. That's why I love this topic because I've totally <laughs> forever have noticed I'm sensitive and my workspaces always are like, they're not perfect by any means, but I'm very diligent. And I've known the data, just like you said, for habits, which yes. is exactly the apple, the candy bar example. Um, yes. It, environment controls 80% of our habits. So, so many people are like, oh, I want to lose weight. I want to start exercising. I want to do a better work life. It's all about your environment. For example, if you don't have junk food in the house, you're less likely to do it. I have a pull-up bar behind me. Guess what I do when I walk through that door? I do pull-ups because it's right there. I'm like, oh, this will be fun. And even if it's just one, I have all kinds of tricks that I've tricked up my environment so that I have healthier habits. And this has to a lot to do with clutter. I just want to commend you. I love the pull-up bar. I have to say, we one year, Santa, way back when, brought a pull-up bar for the kids when they were really young. And now we have a second one in our outdoor space. And it's just- I love it. <laughs> this, is, this is what I like to call live by design and not default. Yes. Design yes. your home environment. And there's no reason it can't be a supportive, wonderful place. It, it, because why not? Yeah. Why not? So you just mentioned a moment ago that you can feel the clutter in your body. So that- leads me to a second study. And this one was some ethnographic research that was done in California. And they were measuring cortisol levels, hormone, the stress hormone, uh, with saliva samples. And they were watching and really listening to the way people would talk about their clutter or their lack of clutter. And it's probably not too much of a surprise, but those who perceived clutter had spikes in their cortisol levels when they were talking about it. And those who did not perceive clutter did not have the spikes. And so sometimes couples will come to me and say, can you help us? Because one of us feels the clutter uh -huh. and the other one doesn't. And so it is really, it really is perception at the end of the day. This is why it's so much easier to go into a neighbor's house or somebody else's house to say, oh, I would get rid of this and that and that and this, because it's, 
what your perception is. And also we don't have the stories that, yes. that those homeowners have with their things. And so the research supports it. The, if you have too many things on your desk, it will overwhelm your visual cortex and it will be hard to concentrate. And so, so many different reasons for saying, you know what? I think I'm going to adjust my clutter. I'm going to create a lighter home environment and so just tremendous benefits come from that. Wow. I love that. And thank you for sharing the research because we all know this is very real. And even those who don't perceive it, maybe it's a partner or a friend or something, or they might go, maybe those who don't perceive it go into a really extreme, like a hoarder's house or something, or someone who's really extreme on the clutter. And at some point it's going to overwhelm even the least sensitive of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And often, I mean, it's, it's, and, and also you, we don't have to be a hoarder to have clutter as right, well. Right. It, it, there's a huge continuum there. Um, and so for most of us, we can, this is something that we can adjust. I think with, with those who would identify as, as hoarders or collectors, it's good to work with trained people, trained uh, therapists yeah. and so forth. And, and yes, but for the rest of us, yeah, we get to be open to the idea that we can create change if we want we to, do there's it so much we can do. So I want to talk about how people get started, but I just want to mention, I probably shouldn't use that. That word hoarder, I think has a lot of shame and judgment. And we just talked about not having that. Maybe people don't, but I don't want to shame anyone who has a lot of accumulation of things. And so um, I like the collector word better. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> it, to me, I feel like it carries less societal baggage. However, Absolutely. people people have said, I self-identify as a hoarder and, and I don't take any yeah. offense Good. to it. So it's, yeah. I think it's a neutral word. It's just how mm -hmm. do we want to... Yeah. interpret it. Well, and I have someone in my not too far circle that is in that category, we'll say collector. And I've talked to my family about it a little bit. And I just have so much compassion because I know at the root of this person's um, behaviors is um, anxiety and shame. And like, I just have, I want to cry because I know that it's not a desire that, that they want to have a, a un, you know, healthy environment for themselves. It's literally, that's why, like you said, working with a professional that can actually deal with the underlying, usually it's in the box as a medical professional of anxiety, OCD, that's the box. And we don't have to label anybody, but that's stuff that you can get help for. And there's no shame around it. So I really no like shame. talking about it this way, because I have not too far, like I said, in my circle that I know someone that has dealt with this as well. Yeah. Yeah. No shame whatsoever. I like to, I like to say that's, that's a net negative. So often we'll, we'll have the clutter and then we'll have these heavy feelings yeah. around them. And so we're, we're, it's kind of like we're hit twice mm -hmm. and it's not necessary. We don't have to do that. So, so true. Um, so I want to talk about you, you gave me some notes before of questions and good ideas and I, the fear of missing out. How does oh. that have to do with, I love that you brought that up because I wouldn't have thought of that with clutter, but why is that a key component of being able to get rid of stuff? And what's J-O-M-O? -O? Tell us about that. Oh, this is so fun. So so my sisters are natural minimalists and so is my dad. And I will tell you, I'm not a natural minimalist. I, I'm an inspiring minimalist and I've benefited from minimalism, but I'm a maximalist. Like I have mm -hmm. always loved things. I would travel the world and I was always like, well, I have to buy something to, you know, show that I was here. Mm -hmm. And, and I have all these stories with the things. And, um, and I had a lot of fear of missing out. And so the FOMO and um, I always wanted to buy the things. I always wanted to eat everything. I always wanted to yeah. go to every party, just do it all. And, uh, and I got sick and I developed some autoimmune conditions. And then I later realized it was toxic mold. And we've done six remediations. We've wow. been working on this for a couple of years. My house is finally safe. I, I can tell, I can walk into a building yes. and I, I know right away, you can blindfold me. I can tell you where the mold is. And uh, I, uh, so through this process, through this journey, I learned to let go of all the stories of my things that I was keeping, these things that weren't serving me, these things that kept me sick. And I learned to lighten my calendar and um, really get intentional about where I would show up and when I would show up. And, and I learned that no thank you is an acceptable response. And I had been, you know, a pleaser my whole life. And so that felt really awkward in the beginning. And um, and so see, <clears throat> so you'll hear me coughing and wheezing just a little. That's it. I'm I'm healing. 
<laughs> excuse me again. And I'm grateful every day um, for this journey. And uh, it's, it's helped me lighten up tremendously. And so, oh my goodness, remind me where I'm going with this, Dr. Jill. Uh, fear missing out and J-O-M-O. Missing out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Still a little brain fog sometimes with the toxic mold, but it's getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And so I had this fear of missing out. And, um, and then I realized it wasn't doing me any favors. And all it was doing was creating heaviness. And so I was reading, doing some reading, and I came across a term called JOMO, joy of missing out. And I realized that JOMO could be the perfect antidote for this FOMO. And then one of my clients said, Heather, what about POMO? Peace of wow. missing out. Love it. <laughs> so good, right? And so here's how it works. Let's say you go to the store and there's a cute pair of pants and you get, get two for one or you know whatever it is, but you don't need the extra ones. And they're cute, but they don't fit exactly right. In the past, I would have bought them just because. And now I can say, mm, I'm not going to buy them. And the joy or the peace of not buying them means that I save my money for a pair that fit perfectly, that I love. And it means that I have more space in my closet. <clears throat> Excuse me. This can also work with your calendar. So you get a lot of invites to things and I really love the idea. And I read this in the book, Essentialism by Greg McCowan. And it said, if you say yes to all the good opportunities, opportunities that come your way, there won't be any room for the very few great opportunities. And so the joy of not doing every single thing that you kind of really didn't want to do anyway, is that you get more space to do the very few things that you did want to do. Oh, this is so good on so many levels. And again, so relevant for people to hear. So thank you for sharing. Interesting comes to mind. I'm going to share a little recent experience that has to do with mold and clutter in my own life. So I have a storage unit in a condo that's down the hall. And um, I moved in here about 10 years ago. So when I moved, I moved from a house that was larger and put, um, it was old medical records, old photos, an old wedding dress, old, you know, cheerleading uniforms. And this was in the storage unit. It wasn't full, but it was stuff that for 10 years living here now, I've never rarely, I should say, gone in there. And someone brought into that storage unit, some moldy ski equipment. I don't know what it was, but all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, I would go in there for seconds, like a minute or two to grab a suitcase or something. And I would get so sick. And I started to realize I'm like you, I'm like a mold dog. I'm like, oh no, my storage. And it wasn't stuff that I brought in. It was, there's four units there and it's an open room. So all of a sudden I became so toxically um, sensitive to my storage unit. And literally I've been for the last couple of years, what am I going to do? That stuff's in there. I don't really need any of it. I yeah. don't know if I want to get rid of it yet because it's photos and memories and things, but I'm also like stuck because I can't deal with it. And it's not stuff like just say it was just old games or I would just be like, get rid of it to goodwill. But this was like my own photos, medical records, financial documents. So it was a little bit more personal. So here's the deal. I have the most beautiful parents in the world. They live in Illinois. They're in their seventies. They know that th this was one thing I couldn't do for myself. And just this last month in August, when we're recording, they said, Jill, what if we drove out there and we took care of your storage unit? And my parents drove 16 hours and they spent two days. And I'm, you can hear me emotional because it was like, it was one thing I can do a lot of stuff for myself. And I very independent. It was something I couldn't do for myself. And they knew the value this is. And, and I'm mentioning this for multiple reasons, the mold thing, but also this was offsite. I don't see it. I don't deal with it. I don't go in it more than twice a year. It's just way down the hall. It doesn't affect me, but guess what? Mentally, it was a huge burden because I was like, what am I going to do with this stuff? I don't need it. I don't want it. Some of it I wasn't sure about. And my parents drove out here. They spent two days and they clean and they're not sensitive like me. They had no trouble. Of course, they wore masks and stuff too, but even so they were fine. They got rid of everything. They donated to Goodwill. Some of it went to my siblings. Some of it they, you know, gave away. Some of it they shredded. My dad sat out and shredded papers for like two days. Like it was the biggest gift in the world. And guess what? Yes, this was just a couple of weeks ago. When that happened, I had nothing to do with it because I couldn't because of my sensitivities. But after that was done, I had so many tears of joy and gratitude for them. And I felt like since that's happened, my productivity has skyrocketed. Oh, yes. 
Yes. And this is, and I'm saying this because number one, it's this weird mold situation. Number two, it's this incredible gift. My parents like saw the value and for them, like there's nothing more valuable that's worth a million dollars to me, like with their, their time and effort and energy. And I just publicly have such gratitude for what they did. And then it changed my life because all of a sudden I'm free of that weight, that mental weight. And I'm sure I'd love your comments on that, but it's such a funny story and such a gift. I love them so much for doing that. Oh my gosh. What incredible parents. And I feel like I, I've got tears in my eyes. Just, just. <laughs> and you know, cause the mold everything. thing, right. Cause we have handcuffs. Like I couldn't do it. I oh. couldn't do it myself. <laughs> yeah. This, I mean, I, I definitely know that I still have trauma to process from, from this mold journey myself. And your parents gave you the gift of lightness. Yes. And, <laughs> and what an incredible gift that is. And you also mentioned a moment ago that the room was down the hall and it was full of memories and things like that. Mm -hmm. And here's what I want to say. The memories are inside of you. Yes. And you can trust that if something is important and you're meant to remember it, you will. That room is not full of memories. That room was full of stuff. Yes. <laughs> I love it. And that's because, because we'll get trapped up or we'll get tripped up sometimes uh -huh. saying, I can't get rid of this. I, I, it's all my memories. And often I work with people who, um, have spouses that have dementia or their parents did. And so they're very, you know, understandably very nervous about letting go of anything. And so what we'll end up doing is we'll hold on to everything, thinking that we're keeping the memories, but frankly, we've got so much stuff that we're not seeing the things anyway. Yeah. And often when we do allow ourselves to let go, we give ourselves a chance to remember it again intentionally, and we can let go from a clean space. And so those memories, I will tell you for me, it was harder to let go of my book collection than it was of my wedding dress. Yes. And the wedding dress to me was a fun dress that I got to wear. And now somebody else could wear it if they wanted to. Somebody that's not, yeah. you know, uh, that doesn't have issues with toxic mold. And I had all these stories in my books about who I was and what these books made, you know, said about me. And, and so that was an interesting exercise, you know, to just really confront that. No, the books actually are paper and ink and glue. And Heather, are you going to let some paper, some ink and glue keep you sick? No, no. And so it's, um, yeah, we get to let go of these things that our body is sensitive to. And, and sometimes it's not just like the physical, the clutter, the toxic mold. Um, I, I, often my clients will lose their excess weight as well. And, and the reason why is because they realize that anything that they're taking into their body is clutter if they are sensitive to it. Yes. And all of a sudden losing weight is no longer personal. Yeah. It's nope. I'm decluttering my diet. I want to feel light. I'm taking the lighter path. And when we take this lighter path, we let go of all the judgment, all the shame that we should be somewhere else, or we should look some other way, or we should look different. Yeah, We just show up in a way of integrity, in a way of design, in a way of lightness, and everything just gets better. Wow. I love that. And I love that you, like me, have used the mold illness journey to really transform your life and find another meaning and purpose and calling and where you're really, really helping people literally lighten their load. I'll never forget in my old office where I had the mold issues uh, seven, eight years ago, um, my medical school books and all my books, that was also for me the hardest thing to get rid of. But once again, now that it's gone, I don't miss it. I don't have any regrets. And since that time, I've had dozens of patients that I've talked to who love books like me and you. And we've yeah. talked through that process of, because books tend to be very sticky for mycotoxins. So they're one of the things that you really probably should get rid of. <laughs> Mattress and books are just like no, no brainers. The rest, sometimes you can clean, but anyway, back to the books. So now I've been able to have that conversation just like you had with us here of like, what does that really matter with your health? And Heather, there's a recent colleague of mine who died in a moldy mm -hmm. home. And I spoke to him just a week before his death. He left me a message saying, Jill, this mold is killing me. And on the phone call, he said, Dr. Jill, do I really have to get rid of my books? And do I really have to leave this house? And we had a very candid conversation. And I said, yes, I'm so sorry to say you do. And who knows, you know, the timing of what and how it happened, but he ended up 
on the day he was supposed to move out, he passed away in his bed. And I just think that's why I'm so bold nowadays with patients with moldy books or moldy materials that they're afraid to get rid of. I'm like, no, no, no. Your health is so much more important. So if you're listening right now, you've been through mold, you're still attached to some of those things. Nothing is worth your health. And I'd love, Heather, you can chime in because you've been through this. Oh my goodness. Yes. And I will tell you on my own personal journey, I had so many questions of self, like questions of self-worth. And I have always been a really confident person, an optimistic person. I, um, you know, I was the only one in my household that got sick and there are four of us. And I will say, I'm grateful to my family that, you know, we got to where we are. We let go of everything. We, we started over and it was not an inexpensive experience. And there was a lot of, there had to be a lot of trust I'll yeah. say. Yeah. And, um, and well, two thoughts here. One children, children can be our teachers. Often people will say, oh my gosh, my kids, it's going to be so hard for them to declutter. My kids got rid of all of their things, all of their art, all of their paper. And I said, thank you so much. And they said, mom, if this will get you better, this is not a big deal. Oh, I love it. (laughs) So often as adults, we will make things big deals that don't have to be a big deal. And the other thing I want to share about this is that I mentioned there's got to be some trust, though that doesn't have to be trust, but trust makes things lighter and trust makes things easier. I, uh, one evening, my husband and I, we were going to bed, the lights were out and my husband brought up finances and (laughs) this is the last thing you want to talk about right before you're going to sleep. And it's, you know, this is toxic mold is no joke when it comes to finances. And, uh, I went to bed that night, fell asleep. And I had one of the most profound experiences of my life. I, um, it was at one o'clock in the morning and I only know because I opened up my eyes afterwards, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, right at one o'clock in the morning, the word trust went through every single cell of my body. It was this very deep commanding voice. And what I saw, I was, <laughs> might sound really crazy, but I was out in the stars and I felt this incredible sense of warmth and love and connectedness. And I opened up my eyes. I saw the clock was one o'clock. I said the word trust outside out loud because I'm like, what just happened to me? So I said the word trust just to kind of center myself and get myself back into the bedroom. And, um, This is a couple of years ago that this happened. And from that point forward, I have been able to trust unequivocally. It has been the biggest gift of my life. I can say that going through toxic mold, going through the autoimmune conditions and all the, all the other things that come along, you know, for the ride, uh, that because of that experience, I know everything will always be okay that I get to interpret my life and the circumstances and I can either go heavy or I can go light. And this is for all of us. We can go heavy. We can go light with anything. My son's soccer coach has a Jeep and there's a bumper sticker on the back and the bumper sticker says, it's probably fine. And if we allow ourselves to even believe that bumper sticker, it's probably fine that can create so much lightness in all of us. And so we can give ourselves that gift of trust. And if we trust, we open up the door to a lighter experience, to more possibility, to things that we can't even imagine. And uh, I mentioned back in my corporate days, that at toward the end, I was, I really, the work I was doing was meaningful to my clients, but it was not really meaningful to me. And I, uh, often I would sit up in bed just thinking like, what can I do? Why am I here? What is my purpose? I, this is not my purpose. And I will just say that the experience that I've had, um, has been the biggest blessing, the biggest gift of my life. I, 
feel so grateful that I get to do what I get to do, get to help others take that lighter path, see that lighter path, know that it's an option, know that it's a choice and that the clutter, the distraction is all optional. We can let it go and we really truly can lean into our full potential or that next best version and that it's never too late. I work with some people who are in their 90s. It is never too late to identify our clutter and to decide to let it go. Wow. Oh my goodness. You have so many pearls. I was going to ask you to close with some hope and you just did it like so perfectly. It's probably okay. I love, love that. And the trust, the story of trust. What what a beautiful thing. And you clearly are now in your divine purpose and the way that you're supposed to be in the world. I love, not that you weren't before, but that's how we always transform, right? And I love, for those listening, I have a lot of people who've dealt with toxic mold and autoimmunity. So if you're listening out there, there is always hope. And part of it comes through Heather's words and path of number one, it's probably okay. And then number two, the trust. I love that. Heather, thank you for using tragedy and difficult circumstances in your own life um, to inspire others, including everybody listening today. Uh, appreciate you so much. It's been an absolute joy getting to know you. Well, thank you so much for giving me the gift of this time with you. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks again, Heather. And let us know where we can find you. Where's your website? Do you have any programs coming up? Oh, absolutely. So you can find me at schooloflivinglighter.com, schooloflivinglighter.com. Uh, Facebook is the same. Instagram is Heather Artema. It's my name. And I often do decluttering masterclasses or webinars. And so I'll share a link. And if you'd like, people can sign up for the next class if, if they would like to create that lighter life. I love it. So be sure and go to schooloflivinglighter.com. And I'll be sure and include that note and uh, link in the notes. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning again to another episode of Resiliency Radio. As you know, you can find all the transcripts, all previous episodes on either YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever you find episodes or listen to podcasts. You can also go to my website, jillcarnahan.com. And if you haven't heard the movie, the documentary, Dr. Patient is out. It's available online streaming at drpatientmovie.com. So be sure and check that out. Let me know what you think. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And thank you again, Heather. Ah, oh, thank you so much.